Hey everybody, it's Eric Stronger here with you with Second Floor Therapy, my weekly podcast on education and music education. And we'll be more really specific about it. And uh, this is my last podcast on Second Floor Therapy for the summer. And starting next week, I'm going to go back to my weekly podcast on what's happening at the Chaska Middle School West Band Department. So um, it's been really fun doing this this summer and maybe in some component. I'll add this into the podcast moving forward. We'll kind of see what happens, but I hope you've enjoyed it and I've enjoyed the feedback I've gotten. And uh, this is my last one, like I said, and it's the second part of a two-parter going back to two weeks ago. And it's based on this book, Wired to Create, which has been just an excellent read for me this summer. And uh, in this book, it highlights 10 things that creative people do differently or maybe more effectively. Uh, and and it's, it's been great. In the last podcast, I went through the first five which were imaginative play, passion, daydreaming, solitude, and intuition. And today I'm going to do the next five with you and talk a little bit about my experiences with them. And uh, they include uh, some teaching uh, components of that too. So I hope you enjoy it. So, And I definitely would suggest reading the book again. It's called Wired to Create. Wonderful book about the creative mind. So so let's jump right into it here. Uh, the sixth uh, thing that creative people do differently is they have an openness to experience. And when I think of openness to experience, I, I think a lot of times middle school kids are not open to experience. Uh, they're afraid. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid of what others may think. Um, they're afraid of uh, jumping into a new situation they may not be comfortable with. So there's a lot of things that, that prevent middle school kids from, from getting involved in that. And I would go even further in saying high school kids and adults, too. We, we struggle sometimes with that. And I speak from experience. I struggle a lot with that. And I think back to when I first moved up here to the Twin Cities when I was a college student in the summers. I was really hesitant about doing gigs. I was just starting to get comfortable playing some pretty upper-level uh, concerts and performances at, at my college. But when I was first starting to get offered some gigs from friends of mine who worked up here who wanted me to sub for them or whatnot, it was scary, and I would say no. I, I felt like I would let people down. I, I guess I just wasn't really sure what to expect, and all it took was to uh, find a couple gigs that were comfortable for me, that I knew at least one other person on the job, and I think getting my foot into the door and just going through it, that I was like, this is not really that bad, and I wish I hadn't said no to so many when I first came up here because it's awesome. Now I'm very open to experience. I will say yes to uh, to things that, uh, as long as I know it's uh, something that's going to be reputable with good musicians and worth my time, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't scare me if I don't know anyone else on the gig or I'm not scared by you know how hard it might be. Um, I feel confident enough in my playing that I'm going to go do it. And I'm very open to those experiences. And I think some of the best musicians up here in the Twin Cities and probably anywhere you go are people who are very open to doing some pretty out there things. I think every gigging musician can write a book or several books on the weird jobs they've played and the crazy experiences they've had through being a musician. And uh, through, through those experiences, you learn and you have fun, you make memories and you get better. And it's just, it's, it, it's life. You're, you're, living, you're living the dream every day, as I like to say. So uh, there's actually a part of me that would love to play a lot more than I do. Prioritize with, with my own teaching and with my family, but um, I really enjoy those experiences, and I, I don't say no to stuff anymore because I'm scared to do it, or because I'm not so sure of you know who's going to be on the gig, or like I said, it's going to be too hard. So, so that's really cool, being open to experience. Uh, number seven is mindfulness, and in some ways, this seems like a no-brainer to being successful in life and whatever you do, to always being aware of what's going on in your surroundings. And, and not just, you know, somebody who's having a conversation with you, but, you know, what uh, what's going on, to, you know, over here, what's going on over there. Like when I'm teaching, being aware of everything that's going on is making me a better person and a better teacher, of course. And I think of uh, just a very simple thing, you know, I, I like to walk. I'm not a runner. I tried, I just, it's not, it's not my thing. But I love to walk. I love to go on, on three to five mile walks every day. And 
a lot of times when I walk, I'll, I'll take my headphones and I'll listen to a podcast or I'll listen to some music. And uh, that's fantastic. I love that. But every now and then, I just love to, to turn off the music, turn off the noise, and just walk and, and look around. I always say I don't like walking on a track. I don't like walking through a mall. I don't like walking in a gym. I want to walk out in nature because there's so much to see and there's so much to take in. And if you followed me for any period of time, you know, I love to take pictures of things I see, you know, flowers, animals, the sky. There's so much great stuff to see out there and listen to and sometimes touch or smell. And when you're not aware of that stuff, you miss out. It, it, sometimes I feel bad when I'm listening to a podcast and I'm out for a walk because I'm like, I'm probably missing a lot of stuff going on around here, some beautiful sights or, you know, maybe there's an owl up in a tree or something or, you know, a deer that's out in the distance looking right at me, you know. So I like to have those moments where I'm just being very aware and uh, being very mindful of what's going on around me. So that's just one little example, but I think that's a huge thing. I think people who are very creative, you know, take in stuff like that. I mean, if you're an artist, uh, you, you are always looking at things through uh, kind of a different view as a lot of other people who aren't artists because you want to be able to draw that or paint that or visualize it or come up with some kind of conceptual idea in your head around things that you see. And even though I'm not, I don't, I'm not a really a great visual artist, I love looking at things and, and taking that in and internalizing that. So, so that's number seven. Uh, number eight is sensitivity. And this is a big one. I think a lot of times creative people kind of get a bad rep because we're oversensitive, uh, sometimes to the point of being considered crazy or, or off the wall or whatever. And I think that in order to be creative, you have to have some sensitivity. Um, I, I used to be a very, uh, I don't want to say non-sensitive, but I was the kind of person that didn't like to grow close to people. Uh, I, had, I had my friends and, and they were great and I loved to hang out with them, but I, it was almost like I didn't want to open up that side of me that could get hurt or open up that side of me that revealed my fears and my dreams, you know. It was, it was a scary thing for me, and that, that changed over the course of a few years, kind of when I was in college, and then, then I think also kind of progressed once I, I moved up to the Twin Cities and started teaching and, and playing here in the cities, and I think through becoming more sensitive, I became a better human being, and I definitely became more creative. I, I became a better songwriter. I, I just uh, I became a happier person. I didn't used to be a, a, a huggy kind of person. I would just shake hands. You know, if you wanted to hug me, you know, it's like, no, don't do that. And now I've definitely become a huggy person. I, I've become a person that everybody I meet, whether it's uh, a fellow colleague, uh, somebody from church, a student, um, whoever it is, I really want to get to know them. And I want to I wanna let them know that they're important and that they matter and that uh, I care about who they are somebody who's a friend it's even taken to another level and I'm a person who as some of my students will tell you that you know I, I've become pretty good friends with some of my former students and and I think that's cool or, or parents of former students or even current students uh, some of those are some of my favorite people in the world and I think that's because I've, I've become very much more sensitive and much more loving towards other people and I think that's huge I think that's huge not only again for being creative but for just being a great human being. But boy, it sure helps the, the creative spirit. You know, again, when, when you're listening to music, writing music, drawing, painting, uh, there's a lot of emotion that can come out of that sensitivity. All right, we got two more left. Number nine is uh, taking adversity on and turning it into uh, something positive or something that's working in your advantage. And that's a hard, hard thing. You know, I, I feel like we all, and, and I, I feel like I've had this a lot. Um, I, I think it's just, uh, what am I trying to say? I think it's pretty pretty common as we all get older. You have more and more friends and family in your life that deal with illness. And uh, eventually you, you deal with, with death uh, on 
amongst your, your family and your friends. And uh, when you have that kind of adversity, uh, you know, I, I've been fortunate not to have any of that personally uh, in my own health, but fighting that adversity and turning it into your advantage, I've seen people do that and it's, uh, it's some of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, you know, I think about my own dad took adversity and, and changed it into an advantage for him when he dealt with cancer. Um, it was really cool to see. And, and I've seen that out of other friends of mine who have dealt with, with cancer and other, other tough illnesses. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And to my own personal stories, they, they don't really seem like anything special compared to that. But I'll share one anyway. I, I love sharing this story. Uh, when I was in college, I auditioned to uh, perform at Disney World every summer. Uh, pretty much every summer, I think all six years of my undergrad. Yeah, I was in my undergrad for six years. No joke. Uh, but I went down to Disney every February. Not Disney, but Chicago. That's where the auditions were. And the first three years, I didn't get accepted. <laughs> I just got a flat out no. And the fourth year, I actually got an alternate. So I'm like, oh, I'm getting close. And the fifth year, I got alternate again. I'm like, oh, I got one more year to try it. And the sixth year, uh, not only did I not make it again, I didn't even get an alternate. So I, I regressed. So, so that was some adversity to me because um, a lot of my friends uh, were chosen to, to be in Disney and I would have loved to have done that with them. And I worked my tail off as a musician and I, I, this was something I really wanted and it was really hard for me not to get those. The good news is, is every one of those years I was in another performing group. Uh, the first two years a group called Kids from Wisconsin the third summer, uh, the amusement park up in New York, and then the last three years, uh, right here in the Twin Cities at Valley Fair Amusement Park. And I guess the way I look at it, and I, I try to put positive spins on everything, is that I met some pretty cool people and had some pretty amazing experiences all six of those summers. And especially when I look at, at Valley Fair, all the connections I made here in the Twin Cities and a lot of the, the gigs I play today, uh, I can, if I kind of do the degrees of separation, I can kind of draw back to Valley Fair and somebody I knew there. So I, I have to think that it was in, in my plan, you know, I'm a very spiritual guy, it was in God's plan, that that's what I did. And, and for whatever reason, Disney wasn't in the cards for me. And that's okay. You know, I still have this dream of when I retire to go play in the old fogey band down there. So. Uh, we'll see, but you know, there was there was I turned that into an advantage out of adversity, and I think every one of those summers, and some of them were a little bit hard, but I think every one of those summers uh, were really great growing summers for me, and I wouldn't be the person I am today had I not gone through that adversity. All right, number ten, and it's probably my favorite one actually, is thinking differently. You know, a few years ago, I finally I think accepted the fact that. I'm a very strange person, and a lot of my friends are strange people, and uh, that's perfectly okay. And in fact, it's more than okay. It's amazing. One of my favorite lines is that uh, normal people scare me. Uh, strange people don't scare me. Normal people scare me. Because normal people, quote, unquote, normal, they want to be like what society wants them to be afraid to be maybe who they truly are in their heart because they want to be friends with a certain person or they want a certain job or they want to be accepted by this group of people or whatever. So they're, they're too afraid to be who they really are because they're constantly worried about being accepted by society. And I think that's where we run into trouble in uh, our culture. There's many areas where we run into I think that's one thing. You know, if I can turn this back to middle school kids, you know, one big thing, if, if, if you've been following me, uh, you know, is I'm really trying to figure out this issue of what clicks and you know, mean kids and kids that do things in middle school simply because they, they want to be in a certain, certain status. And uh, that's where I see it in middle school a lot. I think the uh, creative kids and the kids who embrace their creativeness and embrace their ability to think differently, uh, they're not in that popular crowd. And for some of them, they don't care. 
And those are the people <coughs> I really admire. I mean, that's pretty incredible to be 11, 12, 13 years old and just be comfortable with who you are. So I, that was not me. Um, but I see students like that sometimes. And it just amazes me. I'm just like, how, how incredibly cool for you to be this mature and to get life at such an early age. Um, but a lot of kids struggle with that. You know, they, they, they know who they are. They know what they like, but they see how that doesn't really fit in with what, you know, where they want to fit in. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's hard. And then, then you just have that, that group of kids who just kind of say, screw it. And I'm just going to ignore who I am and just do what's popular. And, and those are the kids I really worry about. And those are the kids I'm trying to just figure out, you know, how do we get through to those kids? And um, unfortunately, when I talk about this, it's, it's not just middle school kids. It's high school kids. It's college kids. It's adults. <laughs> I see this in adults a lot. Um, I see it in the world of uh, how, how adults uh, treat their kids and get them in activities and, uh, you know, make them play a sport year round and get them to the point where they think that's, that's what they really want to do. When I'm like, I don't know about that. I see it in adults when it comes to uh, drinking alcohol. I see it in adults when um, how they, how they dress and uh, taking jobs that make more money instead of taking jobs where, it's what they really want to do. So you see it a lot in our culture, and people are afraid to think differently. And it can be big issues like I was just talking about. It could be more minor issues too, but the, the people who tend to be very creative, and, and I would also add in there happier, and maybe to a point more successful, not as much, but uh, definitely creative and happier are the people who think independently and think differently and aren't afraid to embrace that. So uh, these are the, uh, the last five. If you want to see the last five, you know, get, first of all, get the book, Wired to Create, awesome book. Oh, I was going to read you a quote. That's what the group of five was. This, this is on the thinking differently. This is actually from an Apple commercial from the mid to late 90s. <laughs> and it simply said, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square hole ones who see things differently. And, and you know, when I read that, I think about, you know, I'm weird, I'm strange. There's a level of strangeness that, that I like. But even I see some people who have a level of strangeness that go way beyond me. And sometimes that's hard for me to accept. So sometimes I need to watch myself that I'm not doing to others uh, what some people do to people like me. And, you know, I think about some students I've had throughout the years who, uh, boy, they think very differently. To, to put it kindly, they think very differently. And I have had a hard time dealing with that and going, like, how, how can we get these kids to know that that's okay, that's good, accept who you are, but also know that there are times that you, you have to be able to, there, there, are some, there are some social norms that make a lot of sense in our world. And you have to know what those are. And you have to learn how to follow those to an extent and still find a place for yourself to be creative and think differently. So, so I think that's one of my goals this year is when I have kids like that, is to, uh, to be a person who's there for them and can support that kind of personality but at the same time, help them because the, some of these kids who are, you know, think extremely differently, uh, they're not they're not fitting in. It's hard for them to make friends, and uh, they need our help and guidance as teachers and adults. Uh, and so that's one of my goals is to help some of these kids out this year. So, all right, so there you go. So I'm glad you joined me for these podcasts this summer. If you if you have, this is the first one you've seen, we've only seen a couple. Go back on my channel, Mr. Saunders YouTube channel. Uh, actually, it's just called Mr. Saunders Channel. And you can check it out. And once again, starting next week, I'm going to be back with what's happening in the Chass Middle School West Band Department. Hopefully, I'll have those on mainly Fridays for you. And uh, you can check that out. So thank you so much for watching. And uh, boy, uh, I just want to say one more time, have a great summer. Oh, and i got to cue up the theme song. I always struggle with this at the end. I forget to cue up the theme song. And then I start it too early like that. So now it's going. Now I'm going to leave you. I hope you're all having a great day. And thanks again. See you soon.